uh, pick it up at the back. Simultaneous translation is available uh, in the corresponding channel. Additional headphones are available, as I mentioned, at the room or the registration area. And we would like to, uh, we would appreciate that uh, you change your mobile phones or devices to the vibration or silent mode in order to have your full attention to this uh, session. Finally, uh, please make sure you complete the evaluation form uh, for this session and hand it, uh, hand it in before you leave this room. I'll be uh, uh, giving you the, those evaluation forms in a few minutes. Your feedback and recommendations are very important to us at HEADS. Uh, now we are ready to start, and the title of this presentation is A Distant, uh, a blended platform for developmental reading, a best practice example. And this presentation is in charge of Dr. Celia Cruz Johnson, our Celia Cruz. <laughs> she is a reading instructor from the reading uh, department at San Jose City College. Let us welcome Dr. Celia Cruz Johnson. Yes, good morning. Um, I think that um, I'll just go through the PowerPoint presentation and share with you my experience of how it's been um, since 2003 when I started the Blended Platform. And I'll leave the, five, the last five, seven or eight minutes to, uh, for your questions. Um, just write them down so you don't forget the questions and so you'll be able to ask them later. The way I set up the PowerPoint presentation is based on how you can do a blend of uh, reading course, but also it incorporates how I've done it and what I've learned and what my experience has been. So it's a combination of the two, how you can do it and how, it, how I've done it. At the end of the PowerPoint, I have my email address in case any of you are interested in uh, a copy of the PowerPoint, I'd be happy to share with you. The last couple of slides are also, also include data um, that I used for my dissertation that was written based on the Blended platform. So it's a, it's a combination of how you can set up a Blended platform, how it works, what hasn't worked. I can share with you if you still have some minutes at the end. Uh, some of the persistent rates and uh, uh, retention rates in the Blended platform and how it compares to the face-to-face. -face. If not, we can chat via email later on. Like I said, my address is at the end of the PowerPoint, and uh, I'd be happy to talk to anyone about the platform or how your institution can set it up or how you can tweak it to work that way and so forth. So again, muchas gracias for being here. And just like I mentioned, is uh, the presentation is organized to in a setup where you can see how a blended developmental course can be set up, how you can create it, and how you could incorporate it to the real world. For those of you who are uh, unfamiliar with the blended term or what we call hybrid in other places, and this is based on a well-known definition, blended learning combines effectiveness, socialization opportunities, of the classroom with technology, technologically enhanced active learning possibilities on the online environment. So it deals with students being online. My class is set up where um, students come to see me for an hour and 45 minutes on Tuesdays, and on Thursdays they have work online. So the class is set up in the sense that I lecture, I present the skills, the very developmental reading, whether it is for learning how to act of learn, time management, whether it is to identify the main idea, uh, inference skills, uh, marking and annotating. So we have a combination of learning skills in this particular developmental course. But let me give you a little bit of background information. We started the course, we, because at the time there was two of us, in fall of 2013. 
in other words, 11 years ago, um, between a learning community of two courses, a developmental reading course and a writing course. Both of these were two levels below English composition, freshman composition, and we were given the okay to start it with 15 students. Low enrolled, it was a pilot, and the dean said, okay, just try it out. Both instructors had very extensive um, experience in ESL before I became a reading instructor. I was an ESL instructor here in Puerto Rico and back in California. And when we finished, kind of finished as a learning community, in spring of 2012, the course was waitlisted. That means we had 35 enrolled and perhaps 12 on the wait list. So there was, it was almost a setting where you can perhaps need two sections. It was such great demand at the time. Since fall 2012, uh, it's no longer a part of a learning community. It's a standalone course. The enrollment, again, it, it's low because students, first, I used to teach the level below. Uh, our reading program at the college has three different levels. This is the second level of three. So I would teach a level below, the class level below, and the students will move up with me because they felt comfortable, they, they wanted to continue with the teacher and so forth. I no longer teach that level course because I'm off um, doing reassign activities. So I can't recruit from the class before, so enrollment has become technically a problem right now. It's a low enrolled, but I have to look and enroll and look for more students. So before I came in this morning, I sent an email to the counselors. I need help. I need a couple more students in my section. Can you guys um, help me out? So we'll see what happens. Students now also participate in peer tutoring, a peer tutoring program that is sponsored through Title V. San Jose City College is a Hispanic serving institution. So through Title V, we have certain amount of money where we have peer tutors. These are students who have completed the course, perhaps are in English 1A, English composition, and are helping students get acclimated to the classroom, help them with time management skills, helping them tutor in the sense of let's review main idea, let's review supporting details, let's review patterns of, uh, of organization, let's review what it's needed, let's review how to write a summary. So these peer tutors are kind of supporting what's done in the classroom. Sometimes these peer tutors are also in the classroom and they work as I'm, after I finish with the skill, just helping me work in small groups, making sure students are completing the task and giving them one-on-one. -on -one. This in-class tutors are also part of the tutors in the tutoring center which is also uh, a reading and it's called a reading and writing center. So the students can see them in the classroom, there's a connection and they will continue to work with them in the reading and writing center. So it's a, it's a link, it's a connection, the students don't feel so isolated, so they feel like the sense of familia, which as you know, research shows that First generation students, first or second semester students sometimes feel isolated in the college and then they stop coming. So this is one way where we help them. Uh, I also work with the Title V counselor, assisting students with student services activities, whether it is he can come into the classroom and talk about educational plans, he can come in and talk about time management skills, or the students can attend workshops that he offers. So if there's a link, there's a connection. Students can uh, say, oh yes, Dr. Lopez is the counselor, I will go to his office and the counselor touched the basis with me, and uh, he goes, okay, how are the students doing? Is there anyone you need me to help you with? You want me to call them in to see what's going on? So it's that part of support group. So it's no longer a learning community with their English class, but I am working closely with a different support group that is also helping the students. So what is it that you need? Uh, for a blended course. First, you need an instructor who welcomes challenges and is not afraid of technology. Remember, I mentioned earlier that my students help me with my iPhone, so I'm not afraid of technology. I'm just sometimes going, okay, I can't do this. Can I find a different way of doing it? So sometimes the students help me. So um, 
someone who likes to keep up in current events, someone who doesn't have to go with a strict lesson plan, if something is happening in the world and you want to incorporate that into your classroom that day, just change your lesson plan. And it works. Students love it. Uh, you need an instructor who's aware of the student's need, who understands that life happens. And, you know, I've had students not show up for the final exam. I'm on the phone. Hey, Luis, what happened? How come you didn't show up? Oh, you know, I had a flat tire. Oh, I, I couldn't get a ride. Okay, I'll meet you in my office tomorrow morning at 9. Come and take your test. So, again, trying to assist the student to continue and pursue that lifelong dream. You need an instructor who can think outside the box. It's, this is not working for me. What can I do? What can I, what can I change? Um, someone who has an open door policy, they come into my office all the time. Even if I'm not, I don't have office hours, they go, can I talk to you? Sure. How can I help you? Uh, I'm not afraid of making mistakes. And I tell the students, I'm not perfect. I learn from my mistakes. And that serves like a model for them because sometimes they don't succeed the first time around. And so this says, oh, okay, I can do this. And that is my whole motto is, this may seem difficult today, but tomorrow you're gonna laugh at it. Um, someone who can model for the students how things are done. For example, when we work with marking and annotating, I use a YouTube video, but I also enlarge the reading selection we're going to use through an overhead projector, and I model for the students. How would I mark and annotate that passage? And they go, oh, that's all that you need to do? We all have our different styles. So again, showing them how it works, it can make a big difference. Uh, you need an instructor who should be trained to teach online. It makes a big difference. I myself, I don't know how many courses I've taken online, how many training sessions, and how to teach online. And I'm still learning because there are new things, innovative ways that you can use. I had to learn how to use Twitter. I had to learn how to use Facebook. My students invited me to become part of LinkedIn. So again, we work together. As you know, Ann, California has um, a teaching certification, online teaching. At one organization has one. I understand that HETS also has another certification. So it's best to have someone who has that certification or is going through the process or is taking courses to, uh, it helps, makes a big difference. Students, the second key players to the, the blended community is students who are not afraid from a different setting. It's like, because they will have to work online by themselves, who enjoy challenges and who will love technology. Like I said, they have better iPads than I do, mini iPads smartphones, they can log in. I have students who don't purchase their textbooks. They get the digital version of the textbook. They rent their books that way. And their charge is very minimal comparing to a $90 textbook. Students who are willing to learn from their mistakes, students who can work and tweak their time management skills, because online work does require them to, to do some extra work. If your class is one lecture hour, you have two hours of homework, right? If your work online is one hour, you'll have two more hours of work. And they have to understand that. Uh, every semester I have one or two students who forgets for at least the first month of instruction that every Thursday there's work online for them. So by week two or week three, I'm sending them, hey Juan, I haven't seen any postings from you online. Um, have you forgotten that there is work online? They seem to block that part. Oh, I just go to class on Tuesday. So I have included that on my green sheet on my syllabus now. Thursday, you're responsible for getting your work online. And then I monitor them. Students can't give up because it's, it takes some time. It takes work to get to the mastery skills. If I were to pull each one of you and ask you, when you first took an online course or when you were asked to complete an online assignment, were you able to do it like this the first time around? How many of you would say yes? Only one? 
Okay. So the rest of us in here would go back a second time and pay maybe complete half of it. And then, oh, I didn't get that. Let me go back a third time. So again, this is what the students go through. If this is the first blended course they're taking, but after they've gone through the course, many of them take other blended courses or take online courses. It's, it's just a training ground for them. So before you officially, you know, decide to teach a blended course, identify a course that is appropriate for the learning setting that you know for sure you can do half of it in the classroom and the other part online. Begin two semesters or maybe three semesters before. Um, look for research or, or possibilities of material that you can use for your online portion. There's a lot of information out there that you can adopt. Many of our vendors, our textbook vendors, have online sites that we can use. So you really don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's all there for you. It's just gonna, the first time around, perhaps the second time around, is what is a little bit troublesome or you have to work hard at it. But once you have it set, you have the shell, all you have to do is make minor modifications. I never use the same shell every, from one semester to the next. I have to, personally, I have to reinvent, I have to recreate, I have to bring in new reading selections because my theme is uh, citizens in an interlocking world. My students go from my classroom with sitting in a chair, worldwide, virtual trips, without physically leaving the classroom. But I can tell you one thing, when they leave at the end of the semester, they can talk to you about politics, they can talk to you about issues you would not think of because they are coming in from, I hate to read. Or, oh my God, did you know there was an article about this in that newspaper? They come in with their own articles because they're working at it, working at it. Institutional support. You should have someone in, um, as a professional development coordinator who can work with the faculty and will provide for them training on Moodle, Blackboard, WebCT, whatever platform you're using. Uh, attend staff development uh, conferences that would help and support this. Uh, our college, I, I do need to uh, thank our faculty association that they have worked into a contract, kind of a bonus for professional growth for those of us who participate, and that's what you see article, um, 8.972, and I'll share it with you. So um, one of the opportunities we have for professional growth is that when faculty participate in learning communities, like I said, this was a learning community, uh, we can use it as professional growth. And what's required of the faculty is that they attend one hour a week their colleagues' class. I did that for a couple of semesters. So I would go and visit the, the writing course, and I, w I was a student with the rest of the class. And I would ask the questions that I knew the students perhaps were afraid of asking. So they saw a different side of me, not just the one Dr. Cruz in the front of the classroom. Oh, she didn't get that like we did. I, I, no, I had the same question. I was just afraid of asking. So, you know, that allowed the students to feel more comfortable. But based on this bonification that uh, our district has, we're able to do this of a maximum of six equivalent units. So as you know, well, at least in our case, we our professional growth is based on nine units as we move from one category to the next. This serves as part of that. So I don't know if you want to bring it back to your institutions, but it is. Not everyone does it because they see it as more work, but it's a great experience to go sit in someone's classroom. Um, advertise, advertise your learning community or advertise your blended course. You can do it through flyers. I create flyers every semester. You can advertise in uh, the school newspaper. You can advertise in the college catalog and it's class schedule. Now they're online, but before we would have a whole advertisement section in the printer version of the uh, class schedule announcing all the different hybrid or online courses in addition to being listed in the regular section. Visit pre, um, prerequisite courses, promote the class yourself, attend division meetings, uh, make a pitch for it, 
look for referrals from the counseling department, disabled students program, EOPNS, car program in our colleges for uh, athletes and other support services. However, word of mouth is the best referral. I've had different generations of students, the mother and the daughter or son, enrolled in the class because they were the ones who recruited the students. Once, one semester, I had a grandmother who had been recruited. She was misplaced. She was supposed to be technically an ESL student, but her grandson told her he need, she needed to take my class. You have to take Mrs. Cruz's class. So she enrolled. So we, we, we worked it out, so she was placed in the correct class. Okay, and I mentioned a flyer here, something I distribute on campus. I place it on the admissions and records office, the information desk. I post it on the bulletin boards in the student center. I drop off several copies to the tutoring center, computer centers, to seek more students. And, and again, I make it attractive for limited enrollment. You know, everyone wants to be part of the selected group. Students are no different. So if you say 20 seats available, I want to be part of those. So it works, except this semester, like I said, low enrolled. But it's college-wide. Scheduling. When you schedule, make sure uh, you talk to your dean and the class scheduler sets it up properly. I've revised and I've checked that it's been set on the class schedule, but it was set to me twice a week. So I have to monitor and say, no, it's only once a week. Make sure there's a statement that says the other day students are required to do online. It's a hybrid course. And again, advertise in a separate section um, of the class schedule to make sure people see it. Here's a sample of the front page of the course syllabus. And like I mentioned that um, there's an important reminder, welcome to our hybrid course where half of the coursework assignments and learning is done on the computer. I'm reminding the students they need to go online. You attend a class on Tuesday, but you're also responsible for the work that is posted every Thursday on Moodle. And I make them initial that paragraph on the green sheet that is their agreement. There's our agreement that they are going to be looking at that. Um, some sample themes, uh, like I mentioned, the course, the general theme is becoming citizens of an interlocking world. We talk about some of these issues, immigration, legal, illegal immigration, higher education, elections and voting, famine, poverty, wealth. Uh, Japanese internment camps. Um, national issues, international issues, health discrimination. And, but I also asked the students the first day of class to tell me what they want to read about or what they enjoy reading about. I remember that one semester we read about steroids and athletes and the young ladies in the classroom were bored to death and the young men in the classroom were, oh yeah, yeah, that guy used steroids, look at. So, it, and again, I, I tried to balance things out but I ask them for their input because I want to make sure they're engaged in this process and they're participants of what's going on. And like I said, they bring in topics. Once they're linked into something, they will look for additional information. They find something, they say, oh, can I share with the classes? Not a problem. Mention textbooks. Uh, I mentioned in Japanese internment camps, the novel, the supplementary um, novel that we use is Farewell to Manzanar that deals with a Japanese American family that went through the internment camps um, during World War II. And so that's why we talk about it. It's that the novel is used for, for the students to learn about history, but I use it as the lesson for the inferential figurative language uh, teaching versus the textbook. The textbook deals more with main idea, patterns of organization, summarizing, inferential, graphic organizers, graphic aids, how do you interpret that? But farewell to mention art makes them think and process information at a different level. It's a very old novel but students can't learn from it. And like I mentioned, some of the students don't purchase Bridging the Gap. Um, they just download 
the textbook to their smartphones or their iPads. You asked earlier, they come in like that. Um, the class, like I mentioned, Tuesdays, we meet in the classroom, skills are presented, I do PowerPoints. Um, we, sometimes I create them ahead of time, sometimes if their students are required to read the chapter ahead, we use their notes to create the PowerPoint. So they are the teachers, I am the note taker for them. So I flip the classroom uh, very often. And then we upload those PowerPoints into Moodle and the PowerPoints are there. They can go back several times and see what they miss, what they, which notes to reuse, and how they can expand it. Sometimes we create a PowerPoint where they use it as a general beginning, and from there, they go back to the textbook and take more notes on it, and then we go back and revise it with the supplementary notes they ta they've taken. On Tuesdays, we also correct the work, and we collect the work. They work individually as well as collaborative as in small teams. On Thursdays, the assignments are posted uh, early in the morning, so they have all day. They don't have to complete them by two Thursday. They have until the following Tuesday to submit the work. Assignments are locked once they're completed, and so they can, um, they'll get the grades by Thursday of that following week. Skills are practiced. The skills that we talk about in the class on Tuesdays, they're enhanced and practiced through exercises. Students are required to do forums, they have questions, they have discussion postings, they have reflections. Um, their responses can be uploaded in certain situations. In other occasions, they have to bring in the printer version. So it's active, interactive for them. They, they can't snooze because they, they, they will miss something there. Um, content theme, and again, theme-based integrated reading and writing. It's a reading course, however, I do mention and reinforce that writing is very important. I don't literally stop and say, you misspell this word, but I make corrections and notes on their work and ask them to review. If something is um, too hard for me to understand, I will definitely write, please redo and resubmit. They can go work with the tutor. So again, I, I'm not stopping to go over their writing skills. However, I am letting them know there's work to be done. We also work with critical thinking skills. And we do that not only with the textbook, with the novel. We do that, we online, I have for them subscriptions to San Jose Mercury News, San Francisco Chronicle. In addition to that, because we are citizens of the interlocking world, we go to New York Times, we go to LA Times, Orlando Sentinel, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune. I mean, so we go all over the nation for them to read about what's going on. We also have online resources as magazines such as Mother Jones, which is difficult for this level, but they're interesting articles, and so they work hard at them. We have Newsweek, Time Magazine, Believe it or not, Rolling Stone magazine has some good articles. They don't read it all the time, but there are tasks to complete from there. National Geographic, which is one of the best resources because of the pictures they can see traveling abroad. The Economist has um, controversial issues, but they learn from them. Other government resources, we have CDC. When we talk about earthquakes, when we talk about tsunami, we go to the geological service. When we talk about the internment camps, uh, Manzanar, which is what the, the one they mentioned in Farewell to Manzanar, we go to the national parks. We don't physically, the closest one, Manzanar, it's a couple hours from us near Yosemite. However, we go virtually to Lo Lone Star near, near where this is located. And they can see the mountains with snow, they can see the desert, they can see former barracks uh, through the national parks, they can see what it was like to live in an internment camp set up by the government. So it's very eye-opener, a very eye-opener, and I could, I could only do this with the computer. I can bring in pictures, but it's not the same. Sometimes we teach the class, we meet in the smart room, where each of the students has a computer, on Tuesdays, and then here we go on the virtual tour. They all travel 
We call it Dr. Cruz Magic School Bus. Anyone remember Ms. Frizzle Magic School Bus? I am Ms. Frizzle. And we go on these field trips. And if you have children, you know what I'm talking about. We go on these field trips and it's like, really? We went to Somalia once through Google Earth. And they go, oh, that's a person. Because we're using the map that you can see figures, right? Oh, really? So again, they don't have to leave. And then we read about Somali refugees in New, New Hampshire, how they made a difference in a town that was dying. And then the community didn't want them, but now the community loves them because they've made the town grow. And again, if I had just asked them to read about Livingston, New Hampshire, it would not have the same effect as they, when they went to Somalia and so forth. Um, content, technology. Right now, I was one of the instructors, as I mentioned earlier, we had a pilot for because we were transitioning over to Moodle 2.4. So I participated in the project. So it was, it's better than Moodle 2.2. So in, in 2.4, we use blogs, forums, discussions, emails, the calendar. It's all there for them. Sometimes they're afraid. The miedo takes over, right? So the first two weeks are dedicated. You can do this. There's no fear in this. The computer's not going to do anything to you. The most you could do is just have to redo it, but just go back. We noticed that the hardest part for them was to log in. They forget the password. I forget my password, too, because we all have different passwords, right? So one thing the college has is a, 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 a system that if the student forgets a password, how to log into Moodle, they will send you a, a temporary one. But we encounter one problem, that if a student has an incorrect email account on the college's admissions office, they'll never get the email technical support sent them. So it, it's something for them that the students have to be aware now they have to have current email addresses in the system to be able to get the information they need. Uh, the course also we use library databases. We use um, Longman online reading exercises. We have uh, reading exercises. We have reading tests. And sometimes they're writing exercises. We have online dictionary, Merriam-Webster, but students are allowed to use any of them. Students use smartphones. Sometimes I'll do a survey. In chapter five of Farewell to Mansonite, the author stated this. What do you think he was trying to say? Multiple choice, A, B, C. I don't use a lot of multiple choice because I think I believe in critical thinking. And that's what I encourage the students. But once in a while, it's okay. I just want to see if they read. And so they used a smartphone to do the survey, just answer the question to submit it, and I get the score. They go, oh, yeah. We also use clickers. I was at a presentation yesterday where we were using clickers. They're fun. They're great to use. So once in a while, to change things up. Uh, social media, Facebook. We have a small Facebook group. Uh, Twitter, I've had to learn. Like I said, I had to learn how to do Twitter. I know how to tweet. And they, they were teaching me how to tweet. So. We try at least once or twice a semester to make sure we're on board. We use YouTube. I've, uh, I was opposing to YouTube for a while, but then I found good models for marketing and annotating, time management, active learning, uh, Gardner's multiple intelligence. We're all part of the first chapter in our, in our textbook. I said, I'm going to try this. I tried it last semester. Then I polled the students, what did you think? Did you prefer the handouts that I gave you? Did you prefer the textbook information? Or did you prefer the YouTube? Guess which one they preferred? The YouTube. So I said, OK, we're going to try it again. I haven't tried wikis yet, but well, I'm willing to try those. Uh, I mentioned virtual field trips. We've gone to India. We've been in slums in India. Uh, Slum Dog Millionaire. We watched part of the movie, we read about society, and then they had to reflect. How many of you know how to use a typewriter? How many of you have a typewriter in your home? How many of your children have seen typewriters? 
Okay, I poll my students, none of them has seen a typewriter. They all knew what keyboards were. They all knew what laptops. So you know what we learned about typewriters? We went to India, Dubai. Uh, no, India, it was in India, not Dubai. We went to a large city in India. We learned about the small little shops near the courthouse where we have los notarios públicos that we have here. Those, they have them there in little squares and they type away their documents. The students, oh, they were sitting on the floor, they were sitting on cushions with a little table and typing away. That's how these individuals earned their income. We go, oh, to them, psh, they didn't know anything about typewriters. It's all about computers. Anyway, uh, Japan, we went to Japan with the tsunami. We went to Japan to learn about Japanese society and about the Nasai size and so forth. Uh, we went to Antarctica. We heard that Metallica was having a concert in the South Pole near Antarctica, right? So we, we wanted to, to see what Antarctica was. And we learned about the exploration stations that different countries have near the South Pole. So I learned with them as I teach them or perhaps as I lead them to improve their reading skills. Somalia, Iran, Iraq many places without leaving their chair. And if I don't do a virtual field trip every week, five or 10 minutes, they will say, are we going anywhere today? Uh, one of the activities I also use to support is a voice thread. Voice thread, you can upload material, you can record yourself and the material is written for you, is transcribed. The students that you see my Cecilia, and that's what I said, but if we move, this is just a snapshot of the virtual uh, voice thread. You can see students' pictures on the side because this continues with a comment. As you can see, it's one out of 16 pages. So it, they can do it through iPhones. They can record themselves. They can record themselves through microphones. And it's, it's free. And it takes away from my blah, 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 because they don't have to read it. They can hear what I'm saying. Uh, here's a sample of um, the Moodle page. And I know I apologize, but this is the best I could do with a snapshot of the computer. And it shows you this week of September 1st to the 7th, we read about, we had a video on reading strategies. We had a video on how to annotate active learning and like I mentioned, Gardner's uh, multiple intelligence. I know for a fact that after they worked on um, study skills in reading and um, active learning, they had to reflect. I asked them the question is, why do you think it's important for you to know what learning is about or how people learn? Or why is it important for you to know about multiple intelligence? And, and there are ref each one reflected. And again, here I have Vanessa's comment. And again, she forgot the capital letter. She forgot the according, it has an R in it. But I'll, I'll verbatim, I'll, I'll say what she wrote. According to Howard, to Howard, she's a friend of Howard Gardner's, I guess. Uh, according to Howard, human beings have nine different kinds of intelligence. And it's important to learn them because it gives the capacity to express what is on your mind, and it helps to understand people. It also gives the skills and ability to solve the problems. So again, not perfect, but it shows me that she did the reading, she has some work to do, some improvement, but she logged into Moodle and attempted the assignment. So she will get back response, you know, Vanessa, please remember capital letters when you begin, commas, run on sentence and so forth. However, I'd like you to explain a little bit more on this. Uh, useful links, and here we have information that uh, the Reading and Writing Center, uh, MLA, APA guidelines, how do you document? citation links from the college library. And again, YouTube, because I'm sold on YouTube now. MLA style, how do you document? And the, the documentation piece takes place when we do summarizing. How do you do a citation sentence? How do you embed 
the author, the source, and so forth. So when they get into English 1A, where they're asked to do a research, they can document because they have small practices before they get. It's not unknown to them. Um, the content can be linked to real life events, whether it's on campus or off campus. My students participate volunteer if they have time on college-wide multicultural celebrations. They participate, they're required to, or asked to go to a reading and writing center one hour a week. Many of them do two or three hours a week because that is their hub. It is a choir place. They have computers available. They have an environment that is conducive to learning and they are having tutors and other faculty members available to help them assist them with an assignment. Students also participate in the Metas and Avanzamos, and I mentioned earlier, as a Hispanic-serving institution, we have funding for special areas. Avanzamos and Metas is one of them that provides in-class tutors, peer tutors for the students, and open the Reading and Writing Center two, weeks, two weekends during the semester towards the end of the semester for students to go practice, do mock finals, and work on the reading portfolio or writing portfolio and do work. I forgot to mention that all the reading courses are assessed by a common board grade of final, which is 40%. So bottom line, the students have to pass the final to pass the course. So not only does the class bring new things for them, but the class trains them for the final exam. Students participate in the transfer day. Um, and I, I mentioned that I had some data, and this data is from fall 20, um, 2006. Again, the reading course is um, two levels below English composition. When we first started census time, which is within the first month, we had 32 students. Along the way, between that and finals, we 24 students uh, finished the course. We lost eight along the way. Unknown why, we retain a 75%. Out of those 75%, retention is very high. The passing rate is the one we're still working with. 50% of the students completed. So we have, personally, there's two issues we need to work on. It is what happens after the first month of instruction. Why are they leaving? And then towards the end is, and some of them didn't pass because they didn't show up for the final exam. In some situations, I can track them down and say, one, come and take your test tomorrow morning, but I can't find all of them. There are a lot of disconnected numbers. Some of them just disappear. Towards Thanksgiving in the, in the fall and after spring break in, in the spring. And so it's like, how can I get them? But they do come back. They do come back the semester after or the semester after that. Life happened for them. They had to take off. They couldn't come back. But they come back a second time. I call it, you know, you come back for a boot camp a second time, guys. They go, but I learned so much from you. Why would I go somewhere else? And again, more data. This is spring in 2010. Students at first month, 28 students, when they finish, later on there was 20 of them who finished. We, if finish, it's, they're there. It doesn't mean they, they, they pass, right? Retention rate, 71%. Other classes had 89% retention. However, the passing rate uh, was higher in the blended course than it was in the standalone uh, face-to-face. And again, this chart shows um, the enrollment in the courses and the retention and success rate. And I have to finish because I, we have some questions for you. And again, persistence. Persistence is that they complete the class successfully and they enroll in the same, in the next course. And here we have persistence for fall 2009. Uh, from the, the hybrid class, 48% of the students persisted. In spring 2010, 38% of the students from the hybrid class, the blended class, persisted to the next level. So in both situations, they were at a higher rate 
than the traditional face-to-face. -face. And like I mentioned, um, my dissertation, it is based on this hybrid course, so we can spend some time talking about that. But challenges and for the future. Uh, as enrollment increases because of economic situations, we need to continue. We cut our services on our campus, so we need to restore. We need to continue with in-class and out-of-class tutors, and we, we're doing that with the basic skills initiative funding as well as Avanzamos. We need to use more technology, and we need to begin the computer literacy program at the lower level class for more students to enroll in blended courses. Faculties need to stay current and technology in the changes that take place. And those who are assigned to teach blended courses online, they need to go through a certification program. It makes a big difference. The college should not continue to change platforms. So we've been using Moodle for quite some time. So I think we are set for now. A lot of our students are misplaced. You know, Generation 1.5, they're not ESL, they're not English first language. So it's, we, we work with that. So that's something we need to work on. The English department, like I mentioned earlier, um, we're looking for a common, comp, uh, common assessment, initial assessment that has a writing tool to it because students sometimes scored in English um, 1A in the writing and the reading comprehension as at a third grade level. So there's a big gap right there. So we need to work on something that will balance things out. Um, like I mentioned, the state of California will be adopting a common assessment sometime in 2014. So um, let me go to the last slide if, oops. And I, I think we're gonna go with the questions right now. But I would like to put the last slide so you can see my email address in case um, you would like more information or a copy of the presentation. There we go. Can you see that? Okay, good. So um, do we have um, any questions? I think what's really encouraging, oh, what's really encouraging um, is that I was impressed by the virtual field trips and how much commitment that you have to having them open their awareness um, to these topics. Do you find that when you use those clickers that you have them discussing topics of humanity that aren't, because I, like, I saw how you have Mar uh, Martha Nussbaum, um, kind of the, those kinds of things that are um, difficult to talk about because that's what I think those things are good for. Um, they're difficult topics sometimes to present to them, but it's life, it's real life. And uh, my goal is when they leave my classroom is to be open to conversations. And so we work on it and I, I tell them from the beginning, first day, there will be instances when we will not agree, you will not agree with what I'm saying, I won't agree with what you're saying, but this classroom is a, a setting of respect. And we will talk about things that are difficult, but the goal is to learn, and we'll walk away both learning from this. And so far, in all my years of teaching, and I'm, it's been a, quite some time, I've only had one student walk out, one young lady, and it was due to religious beliefs. Everyone else has been open and willing to share. And sometimes I get to hear, because I have students from all venues of life, and I have students who have spent some time in San Quentin, and I have students who have been homeless, and I have students who come from normal homes. However, we learn to respect each other. And if there are instances when we can't respect each other, we will have a one-to-one -one conversation after class. And th things will stop there. Uh, I would like to know a little bit more how you decide uh, which um, 
topic of um, what exactly to cover in person and what you decide for them to do online by themselves and can you give a concrete sure. example? Sure, uh, the things? skills, you know, like marking, annotating, time management, main idea, patterns of organization are all taught in the classroom through PowerPoints, through reading the different uh, chapters in the textbook. Topics per se that we read about are mainly current events, issues that are in the forefront and that they should learn about. There are some that are consistent, like uh, the Japanese internment camp. It is part of the course because of the textbook that I read. But when I switched to Tuesdays with Morris, which is a different author, we, um, we, we look at aspects from that book and then we read about themes from there. When we read about um, Gary Soto's baseball and short novels, we also look at themes from there. So it, the, the topics vary per semester. I, I have to, every semester there's new things. This past semester we just read about uh, a Syrian refugee young ladies in, inter in camps, because they're not refugee camps. There's no such word in, in Syria about refugee camps. But as these are young ladies and, and young men who are taken out of school at a very young age, and they're working 12 hours a day uh, collecting potatoes that fall off trucks instead of the classrooms. So we read about them, and then the class of students were asked to reflect. Is, if this was you, if this was your daughter, is this what you want? How can this be changed? And, and again, they read it, they loved it, they wanted to read more about it. It's something they didn't know about, but it was a current event. It was a, a topic that attracted my attention, and I knew for a fact, based on what they had selected or they had written for me at the beginning of the semester, uh, it would be an interesting topic, and it was a hit. It was a hit. Hi, uh, I also teach developmental reading at Queensborough Community College. I'm curious to know, see, we found each other on the bus. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm curious to know, you were concerned about the 50% pass rate. I dare say that some of my colleagues would be thrilled to have a 50% pass rate in reading. So I'm curious how that compares to the other, if there are other hybrid reading, developmental no, reading, I, no. And how does that compare to the other course offerings departmentally um, in terms of just your traditional delivery? Sometimes the passing rate, uh, successfully passing, it's, um, they're parallel, they're equal. Sometimes the hybrid is a little bit higher. Um, but I, I think it's like a cycle. Uh, there are some semesters, as, as I worked on my dissertation, there was one particular semester I said, what happened here? It, it, right. it's, it's just like, I, I, I couldn't pinpoint what had uh, happened that semester that the passing rate was not. Honestly, I would love to have 100%, and I always shoot for 100%. I haven't gotten there yet, but I, it keeps getting better. Sometimes better, sometimes worse. Okay. Yeah, no, that's kind of consistent with what we're doing. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Well, I, I actually have to congratulate Dr. Celia Cruz for her uh, presentation. It's, it's very interesting <clears throat> Sorry, to see how she's in, including the use of technology in her reading uh, uh, course. And, uh, and I've gathered a lot of great ideas that I'm going to share with other colleagues later on. Uh, I, I do want to mention that one of the tools that she's using, which is a voice thread, if you go to Virtual Plaza and look at the resources that are available free for faculty use, uh, that's one of the tools that is listed under uh, that category. So, so I invite you all to visit the Virtual Plaza and look at the resources that are available there. Most of them are free uh, to use at any level, uh, and they're very user-friendly, as she mentioned. Uh, the learning curve is really, really uh, not steep at all. And again, I want to uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Celia Cruz and give her a, a round of applause for her presentation. She will be around uh, during the rest of the day, so if you have any questions, you can, I'm sure she'll be available to answer them. 
Uh, please fill out the evaluation form, leave it at the end of the row. Uh, now we have a uh, break, a coffee break. We'll reconvene around 11.30 for the next uh, concurrent sessions. Thank you all for uh, being here and have a great day. Thank you very much.